Hello and welcome to Happy Hour, a Scripps Gone Wild spinoff where we sit down with the folks who make our reads happen. Uh, shoot the shit, see what happens, that kind of thing. We drink sometimes too. I'm drinking an Irish coffee because I just felt like it. And our guest today is Mr. Dave Schilling. Dave? Hey, I am drinking regular coffee. I just want it to be uh, clear to everyone that it is 12 o'clock in the afternoon so i I, in in los angeles it's not quite time to start drinking but during covid there are no rules it's like we're all in an airport all the time that's right and i've been drinking since 9 a.m so (laughs) i feel like i'm this is probably my last drink of the day actually that's good yeah even Um, out and then just crash for the rest of the day exactly and you know one of the reasons i've got to stay sober is because uh i've got a couple of um a couple of basketball games I'm going to be watching today. It's a big, big night. It's a big night. And that, I, I want to start off by talking to you about the bubble. Um, you actually host a podcast called uh, Full Court Chat. And uh, you're dealing with the bubble right now a little bit, right? Yeah. So the story of that podcast is that I am playing a kind of a douchier version of myself who is a journalist and I cover the NBA in this in this. Um, podcast and uh so i'm interviewing you know people who are either um impersonated you know like celebrities being impersonated by improv comedians or you know in- invented characters and there, there's kind of this narrative about me going in and there being surveillance in in the bubble and there's some sci-fi elements to it i have to wear an ankle bracelet if i get closer than six feet to a player it'll explode lots of silly stuff like that (laughs) and it was it was great fun to do we just finished the second season um Uh so there's only 14 episodes if you want to hop in and they're you know 30 minutes you can binge it very quickly but uh it was it was an ambitious fun project to do and i'm I'm glad that that uh, people are listening and enjoying it so So, um what are your personal thoughts how are you feeling about the bubble so far (laughs) Oh, I think it's gone as well as it could have. I almost feel like maybe my podcast would have been, you know, even better received if things had gone wrong. <laughs> you know, the, the, the whole the whole premise of the podcast is this is kind of like a disastrous, uh, apocalyptic, dystopian notion of uh-huh. trapping these people in a, a Walt Disney World resort and forcing <laughs> them to play basketball. But it's turned out fine. The, the games have been great. They've been competitive, they've been high scoring, they've been, you know, close, and there's been, last night, there was a huge buzzer beater in the Raptors-Celtics game. It was insane. Crazy stuff. So, like, overall, it's been a huge success, and and I think the NBA should be very proud of the fact that people aren't getting sick, people aren't, you know, dealing with long-term health problems because they have done it right. They, They put all the players in the same place, they're testing all the time. Uh, they're disinfecting things and they're making people wear masks and they haven't had a positive test since it started. Yeah. So, you know, kudos to them. And I'm glad that they are going to be able to finish the season because I think the Lakers are going to win the championship and I'm a big Lakers fan. That was, that was going to be my next question. But first I do want to comment on the fact that the NBA has been going on again now for how long a month, oh, well over a month, a couple months. And, yeah. A couple months now, not a single positive test. Batman was shooting for six days and Robert Pattinson has COVID. Well, so my theory on Robert Pattinson getting COVID is that he's probably taking his mask off. He's probably taking his mask off all the time when he's not shooting, and he's probably smoking cigarettes. I feel like that is a guy who's either vaping or smoking during his breaks, and that is going to lead to a higher risk of transmission. They have to figure out a way to prevent people from smoking on on sets Yeah, because that is a huge risk. Uh, there's the blowing of, of smoke and, and people spitting on each other just from smoking cigarettes. Um, they have to get rid of that, and, and they need to figure out how they can do some sort of bubble themselves for these movies. Um, I know things like The Matrix are filming in, in I forget where, Australia or somewhere. Probably, and they're, yeah. they're some, some far off land. Um, there are other things that are going to film in New Zealand and... London is not the best place to be filming, I don't think. And, and Batman is filming in London, where they're having just as much difficulty with this as America is. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, you know, let's go to England and things are fine. It's like, no, this is actually just as bad as it is here. So It's crazy to me that someone playing a character famous for wearing a mask. Well, it doesn't it, cover the important parts, you know. It only covers his, his forehead. That's true. I don't think the bat suit was uh, was made with COVID nineteen or other pandemic emergencies in mind. 
Exactly. He should be wearing the suit from Batman versus Superman where he's in the like the robot suit when he fights Superman. He can fight the Riddler, he can fight the <laughs> penguin. He can't fight a common cold. He can't. Um, I I just think it's too soon. I mean, I I I know how important it is to get people back to work. I know how important it is to get movies going, TV shows going because it's an economic driver for a lot of people that you and I know who work on these things, who you know, or craftspeople, they're not big name actors, they're not wealthy day players or, you know, background talent or, you know, gaffers, grips, uh, you know, everybody. All yeah. these people need to work, but it's not safe. If it's not safe, I know there was someone yeah. in Texas who, who died, an assistant yeah. director, and that's just like, it's not, it's not good. There has to be a better way to do this. Um, following, uh, going from that uh, very serious but true statement back to, so I was going to ask you who your team is. Obviously, Lakers. it's the yeah. Lakers. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm surrounded by nothing but Lakers fans, which shouldn't surprise me considering I live in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> they, they, I, I, I am not, I am not, not, a, wait, so you're a Lakers fan, but do you hate the Clippers as much as other Lakers fans? I don't hate them. I do like to see them lose, but I've, I'm in my mid 30s, so I remember when I was growing up, the Clippers were terrible. No one cared about the Clippers. The Clippers were a non-entity yep. in Los Angeles. They weren't Clipper fans. And then, you know, they get Chris Paul, they get Blake Griffin, then they become more of a trendy thing to like. And I feel like a lot of people who are Clippers fans are transplants from outside of Los Angeles. People who didn't have a team before. Yeah. Um, we're just looking for something to uh, root them into the city that they're living in. I lived in Connecticut for a while um, for a job. And I was like, oh, maybe I should be a Mets fan. I don't know. Just just so like I can get along with people yeah. or I have something to converse with people about. I wasn't in Connecticut long enough to be a Mets fan, but it, it would have been sacrilegious and silly for me to be a Mets fan because I'm from California and I like LA sports teams. But I don't hate them. I hate the Celtics. I hate the Celtics because <laughs> that's a rivalry where yeah. these two teams have been going at it for decades uh, in the finals and, you know, the regular season. They've both had storied histories. They're one and two for the most championships in the NBA. The Clippers have nothing that I covet. There is no reason for me to care about the Clippers other than to annoy people I know that are my friends who are Clipper fans. Are are there any are there any possible upset teams you think this year that could surprise everybody? And I still think Toronto has a chance. Um, winning I've last got, night was huge. Really. I've got they, Toronto. I've got Toronto winning it all. Yeah, that's a yeah. good bet. Um, yeah. The fact that they were able to take Game Three gives them a chance. You know, obviously there's there's no home court advantage anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that stuff kind of doesn't matter other than the graphics that they show in the yeah. arena. But um, I think that, that that's certainly a possibility for them to come back from down 0-2 um, to win that series. I mean, you look at what happened with, with Utah and Denver. Denver comes back yeah. from a 3-1 deficit, and they're able to win their series. I think other than Toronto, it seems like it's pretty clear sailing for the best teams in, in the league, yeah. and it'll be Lakers, Clippers, and the Western Conference. Um, Miami is shocking a lot of people. That's yeah. basically an upset at this point. Yeah. That Miami is is taking it to Milwaukee the way that they are. Milwaukee is a, a, still a young team. Uh, Miami is very well coached. Yeah, I would say better coached than Milwaukee. Um, Jimmy Butler is a veteran presence, not not a presence that has been to the finals and can can sort of speak to his teammates the way that let's say Kawhi Leonard can in, in L.A. But he certainly has been in these battles and these wars in the playoffs before. And they just look like a more cohesive, um, mature, composed team. And, and once again, it feels like Giannis is not uh, not present as, as much as he should be in the playoffs, certainly on the defensive end. What do you think about um, the rumblings about Giannis maybe going to the Heat? There's always going to be rumblings when a star player plays in a small market. Yeah. It's just always going to happen. People are trying to figure out how to pry that that big name out of a small town and put them in a big market. And that happened with Kevin Durant. Um, you know, KD, people always kind of thought, well, when's he leaving Oklahoma City? How <laughs> He's not going to stay forever, right? Yeah. And of course, eventually he goes to, to the best team in the league in a big market. And, and despite what people might say, 
the Bay Area is a huge market. I think it is the number three or four TV market in the country. Lots of money, lots of corporate sponsorships and all that stuff. All the glitz and the glamour um, that you would want in a big market team. So it, it, it's not surprising that people are saying that. At the same time, I think he likes it in Milwaukee. I think Giannis enjoys that market. I think he's very loyal in a way that a lot of players aren't loyal to the team that they play for. He just, he talks about Milwaukee a lot. He's involved in, in the community. I'd be shocked if he left. I think he's going to stay for another contract and then maybe if they don't get where they need to be um, in the playoffs in that time, he'll probably leave just to try to win a title. Yeah. I mean, he could just pull a, a Damian Lillard and just, just stay in Portland forever. That's another guy. I think, yeah. I really think, he, you know, even though Dame comes off as someone who would probably like being a Laker one day, he's very proud of being in Portland. He's very proud of being the guy in Portland. And, uh, you know, if they continue first round exits every year in the playoffs, you might think differently. But for right now, he's, he seems very confident in his place in Portland. Yeah. I think, you know, I I I have the Raptors going, you know, going all the way this year, even though the Celtics are certainly not making that easy. Um, I think what I love about the Raptors compared to a lot of the other teams is, you know, all of these other teams are sort of, they're sort of, they have these specialists who are like, you know, you've got your three-point shooter, you've got, you've got all these different things. The Raptors, everybody's just good at everything. Yeah, well, you kind of you need that. You, yeah. The playoffs really is about the guy stepping up. Who's yeah. that guy going to be in that game? Who's going to be the one that's going to pick up the slack? Like, think about, um, you know, that Houston, um, Oklahoma City game seven. Yeah. Where, where, was, where was Russell Westbrook? Where was James Harden down the stretch? Offensively, not there. Yeah. But they were able to make the baskets they needed to make. Uh, <laughs> Oklahoma City also, you know, they're missing free throws. They're, they're missing bunnies. At the they had an insane amount of turnovers. <laughs> Massive amount of turnovers. Yes, exactly. For some reason, Chris Paul is not getting the last shot at the end of that game. I don't know. But James yeah. Harden makes that huge block and, and, and um, is able to secure that win. I don't know if it would have gone in if Dort was going to make that shot or not, uh, yeah. if it wasn't blocked. But it's certainly, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the fact that it – was blocked means it doesn't matter if it was going to yeah. go in or not but yeah. um yeah you have to have those guys you have to have a deep team of at least nine guys uh, maybe 10 guys that you can throw in and out and that's why i'm confident in the lakers um because i feel like they have guys who will get hot and jr smith Dion waiters who are maybe not getting tons of minutes now but in playoff games that really matter i can see those guys you know making big shots or, or, or contributing in, in in small ways yeah uh, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna switch trajectories here from sports uh, to pseudo sports related. But um, so you know you are you know you've written for Guardian, you've written for Birth Movies Death, and uh, lots of other places. So you write about sports, you write about film as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious. I'm always curious about everybody. Like, how did you first? I mean, when did you start really getting into film? Oh well, I went to film school. I went to film school at San Francisco State University. Well, you didn't uh, go to sports school. <laughs> no, I mean, oh, journalism okay. school. I guess I could have gone to journalism school, but no, I, 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 I never wanted to be a journalist. That was not an interest of mine in, in really any way. Uh, I went to, to film school and you know, wanted to write and direct and stuff. Yeah. So I moved out here in 2007, I think, 2007, uh, after college, and was really lucky that I got an internship at a, at a studio. Uh, reading scripts, and then I got to work on an indie movie, doing casting, and then I got to shoot some behind-the-scenes footage for the DVD. The movie's terrible. <laughs> I'm not what's, the, what's, the, the, what's the name of this movie, Dad? I'm not going to say the name of the movie, because it's not good. <laughs> Just in case the director is watching. He's not Fair. watching, but um, no. It ended up not being very good, and, yeah. and uh, I sometimes show it to dates. Like, I don't, I don't go on dates anymore, but one or two times the girl I was I was seeing she's like I want to see the movie and I'm like, all right fine. and then eventually like 20 minutes in she's like can we just fast forward to the part that you're in and I was like yeah of course I don't want to watch this either but they're good they're, there's it's a it was a good cast it was a good cast the one person I will say that's in it that I really enjoyed getting to to see who his job was Steve Root who I love from oh. news radio and obviously Barry now but yeah a real professional and a great a great character actor Anyway, so I'm doing all that. I eventually become a, an assistant to a talent manager, um, then a lit manager, and I'm just like, I'm not happy. I'm miserable because I'm not good at um, 
I'm not good at planning someone else's life. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to kind of like make make appointments for people and keep a calendar and, and answer phones and all of this stuff that's very menial and it has nothing to do with me and my life. And I, I would say I'm probably a fairly self-involved person. You kind of have to be to be in, yeah. in Hollywood. Uh, so I, like, I, I, I want to write. I'm going to try to find a way to write something. And um, I decided I was going to try to like write blogs and stuff because that was 2008, 9, 10. That's that what was, folks were doing. That was really the rise of a lot of um, a lot of personal essays, a lot of um, kind of um, you know just like places like Vice and places like Exo Jane and Huffington Post. They had all of these things that wouldn't be called columns necessarily or opinion pieces. They were just like I did a thing and, and here's here's how I felt about it. That seemed like a good opportunity for me to make a little bit of extra money and also move my career. I ended up writing some stuff freelance for places like Vice and um, eventually became uh, a full-time staffer there, an editor. I, I don't know why they wanted to hire me so much because I had never edited a thing in my life, <laughs> really. Uh, I didn't, <laughs> my, my grammar is solid, it's good, but I wouldn't say that I was like, I knew the AP style guide backwards and forwards. I had no concept of um, journalistic ethics or anything like that, or like how to do an interview or like fact checking. It's just stuff that I kind of picked up and learned. And that was my, my journalism school was, was working at Vice. Uh, before that, actually, I had, uh, I had been, uh, I worked for a porn company as a blogger. So I was blogging about the adult films that they were making. They were, there's this big, like, um, it's like an old factory or something maybe an airplane hangar. And it was converted into a, a porn studio. So there were offices where people were doing like post-production and, and um, you know, physical production and stuff. And then there's a big sound stage where like all the porn was filmed. <laughs> so every day I come to work with my lunch, sit down, check my email. And then eventually I get a, a message saying, hey, come down to the set. We're gonna be shooting some porn. And so then I'd walk down to the set. I'd have a video <laughs> recorder and like, I taped interviews with the the, the, the the stars of the films. And then I go log into WordPress or whatever it was. And, and then like, hey guys, just wanted to let you know we're filming Babe Runners, the new Blade Runner parody that's also a porno. And then send it out and then like put little photos and videos of people with their clothes on because for some reason the owner of the company was like, there's not going to be any nudity in your blog. But this was like a promotional tool that they had to get people excited about these movies and hopefully buy them at some point. I don't know. I guess people were still buying porn then. Um, and I did that for six months. <laughs> it was a horrible job and I got paid nothing. And then I found out the owner of the company was um, grifting pensioners in the UK. And this was like a money laundering scheme and porn. Company. What would you say is the greatest lesson that you learned from your time working at the porn company? Um, always make sure the lens cap is off. <laughs> I wonder how many porns have been halfway through shooting when someone's like, oh, sorry, guys. Tons. Oh, there's so many just disgusting stories that I have that I will not tell <laughs> in on, on the air. I think that's a whole other podcast. Yeah, I should do a podcast about pornography. About your experience uh, in the porn industry. Where you, yeah, I, I'm, an episode for each month I was in the porn industry. Uh, <laughs> and so I just kind of stumbled ass backwards into journalism. And never wanted, and I've never, I never liked it. I was yeah. bored all the time, but it was paying me very well. I went from yeah. Vice to this website called Grantland, which was probably, I would say, one of the best pop culture sites of the last 20 years. I yeah. Think. It was really us and, and Gawker, basically. Yeah. And I would say we were better than Gawker, but now they're both gone. Um, and then I went to The Guardian, and I worked there, and that was kind of a dream because they let me write whatever I wanted to, so I could write about movies and sports and. I could write about Pokemon Go. <laughs> I could write about politics. I was doing coverage of the election that year in 2016. So it was really cool. And I learned kind of more about my own voice as a writer. And then I got into sports more full time when I went to Bleacher Report. But now I'm not, I'm not doing journalism at all anymore, really. I, you know, when I wrote for Birth Movie's Death, it was because I love those people, you know, yeah. all, the, all the guys and, and gals who work there. And uh, I just like writing about and talking about movies. Um, yeah, but journalism is is no good. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a journalist, you know. I'm what I'm doing now is what I'm happy to be doing, and yeah. uh, 
it, it served me well for many years and paid me well. And I met a lot of great people and, you know, I, I became better known because of it. But, you know, sure. I have other, other interests to, to enjoy now. And by that, you mean you, being a full-time paid staff member of the Screen Drafts podcast. <laughs> yes. It's so weird that uh, I constantly am getting these giant checks from you know? Clay and Ryan all the time. I'm like, what is this? Oh, those are your, your residuals. Yes. Yeah. I just bought a boat. From Patreon money. From Patreon money. <laughs> it's Nothing incredible. Money. I haven't been on in months. I will be back. Um, I think I'm recording in two weeks. We're doing the Wesley Snipes draft. Right, right. Uh, I saw you, that. If you guys are fans of screen drafts, you will enjoy that very much, I think. Um, it's weird to me that we've never drafted together. It is weird, isn't it? It's like, a I, lot of people I've never drafted Yeah. I Graham, feel like, I've never drafted with Graham before. Yeah, yeah. Well, have you drafted with Cogman? I was at the Star Trek draft, so I had been pestering Clay for months. Like, when are you doing a Star Trek draft? I got to be at the Star Trek draft. He's like, there are some people who are also enthusiastic about the Star Trek draft. And they're, you know, we're, we're going to probably put them in there and not you because they're more important than you. And I uh, think he was talking about Brian Cogman specifically. And Brian's great. I love Brian. But yeah. the brilliant, brilliant writer, smart movie uh, aficionado eh. <laughs> <laughs> you'd quibble with some of his his drafting choices i'm sure oh yeah uh, he yeah he's an arch rival um we can bond over our love of star trek the motion picture but uh <laughs> and then mark bernardin was in there too and he's you know writing for star trek now and uh, yeah. so it was that was kind of a coup so i was okay with it but i got to be there and i got to pipe in chime in every once in a while between picks and give my expert analysis as a giant star trek fan um, who else? I, I drafted with my girlfriend, Hallie Kiefer, who, um, that our episode was Lauren Michaels movies. Yeah, that I remember was great that one. because we were just at that time thinking about submitting to SNL this year. And of course we did. And I don't think, I don't think we got it because I feel like we probably would have heard by now. But, uh, yeah. What else have I, I done? Uh, sports movies with my friend Zed. Who I, oh man, I had a, I had a, I had an aneurysm movie. listening to that draft. That was my first one, and I, I was not really, I hadn't figured out the game quite yet. So there were a lot of movies that I love personally that just didn't necessarily belong on a definitive best of sports movies list. Yeah, like Rollerball is probably questionable, but I will say that that was an entertaining episode because there was a lot of bizarre surprise, and there was a lot yeah. of. Uh, consternation from, from the guest. I, I always think that that show is better when people do crazy shit and I do too. bad things. Like, <laughs> as much as you want it to be a definitive list, what you really want is the pyrotechnics and the excitement. Yeah. yeah. It's, the a ba that, it's a balance. You gotta, it's, yeah. it's finding that balance between like your personal, what you want on there personally, mm -hmm. what you think should be on there, and what you think is just gonna be fucking entertaining for people. Exactly. Yeah, you want you always want to have a kind of holy shit jaw dropping moment in one of those episodes. Like so, we just did, uh, we just did the westerns two draft, the I second part of our westerns draft, and like I I I jokingly play young guns at pick four. I did that just solely to fuck people up <laughs> and to make for and to make for good listening and to make for good listening. Yeah, sometimes also you have the opportunity to expose people to things that they wouldn't necessarily yeah. watch otherwise. So like. For me, I picked uh, Mr. Mike's Mondo video as the number seven on the Lauren Michaels draft because one, I love that movie, and two, I want people to see this this bizarre film that I, I don't think anyone else in the um, on that draft uh, episode had ever seen or heard of before, except for my girlfriend, who I forced to watch that movie yeah. <laughs> against her will, sober, sadly. Um, I'm sure that didn't help her enjoyment of it, but yeah, I, I love screen drafts. I just, uh, I just, I'm very adamant that something crazy has to happen in every episode. And I guarantee you that the Wesley Snipes draft, something crazy. Will happen. I mean, it's Wesley Snipes, so it'd, it'd be fucking better. There's so many movies that he's been in that, you know, you can pull a Passenger 57 out or you can go and, and do Dolomite is my name, which... I am going to put on that list because he steals that movie. I, I'm, I'm serious. He steals He's movie. fantastic in that movie. I'm going to be really upset, and I would be shocked if White Men Can't Jump doesn't it find kind of has to be number one. On that I don't list. want to spoil what I'm thinking about. Because yeah. I know there's a lot of crossover between this uh, world, the Scripps Gone Wild world, and the Screen Drafts world. So there's probably people on here who are like, ah, don't tell me what you're going to do. 
I there, assure you I'll change my mind before we record. There is a fair amount of crossover. I will say, I will just just when you're, you know, as you're preparing and and yeah, I know Clay is really pushing for US Marshals to make it on the list. I can't imagine that he's not since it's his favorite film of all time. I was um, trying to get it on the Star Trek list. I'm like, just I, because the same person directed Star Trek Nemesis, you can't, you're crazy. You, you gotta put U.S. Marshals on there. He's trying to put U.S. Marshals on every list. Um, He's a I, demented man. I would throw in uh, a film to consider for the list. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Wesley Snipes is quite delightful in an underrated little movie from 2009 called Brooklyn's Finest. I never saw Brooklyn's Finest. I need uh, to watch that now. Now that you've suggested this, I am going to go back and I'm yeah. going to watch it. He plays a character named Casanova, mm. and uh, it is a delightful performance in that film. And I, I want to remember, I'm trying to remember, I feel like, is it Freddie Prinze Jr. who's in that movie? I feel like... Not in 2009. No, I'm, I don't know why I'm thinking Freddie Prinze Jr. It's Richard Gere. <laughs> <laughs> Easy to confuse the I two, I think about I Freddie Prinze Jr. a lot. Yeah, both I, of us wrote for WWE, so that's there's that. You know, um, that's that's a, you know what that's an interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, good. <laughs> um, because I have just I I've, I've been a I was a wrestling fan like a crazy wrestling fan until the time I was like 19, mm -hmm. and stopped watching it after that and haven't really had anything to do with it since. But I've just started binging Dark Side of the Ring. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, which I, I've always known existed. I've just never really gotten into it. And I've just started season two. I just finished the second part of the Chris Benoit episode. I I'm just curious, what was your experience like working for WWE? Well, I signed an NDA, so I can only talk about it so much. <laughs> sure, <laughs> um, sure. But I mean, generally speaking, not great. Um, yeah. That's why I lived in Connecticut. I was working at WWE because their office is in Stanford. I think I'm allowed to say that. I can say where they are based. <laughs> <through> the owner. <laughs> um, yeah. No. It's it was not great. It was. You should never live your dream. I think. <laughs> I think whatever your dream is, aim for something slightly to the right of that dream. Don't ever exactly like live that dream out. Because I did it. I'd always like when I was a kid. I would I would book wrestling cards with like in a notebook and like yep. have matches and like with my toys and stuff yep. and I was like Same here. <laughs> seven, eight, nine. I was like, okay, yep. this uh, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. So I was I I was doing that job when I was a child for free. Uh so it was it was a pretty heady experience, but a lot of times when you do something that you have a, a, an emotional attachment to, you can't divorce yourself from that emotion and just do the job the way that it needs to be done. And I think um a lot of what went wrong for me was that I was too enthusiastic. I was too excited about it. And a lot of the people that were there are very jaded yeah. about it and don't want to hear all my enthusiasm and it just rubs them the wrong way. And I think it was mostly that. If yeah. I had, I was <laughs> you know, if I had just been kind of quieter, I might still be there. But better that I'm back in LA and not living in Connecticut during COVID. Who were, so so growing up, who were your guys? I was a big Bret Hart fan. I loved Ric Flair. I loved yeah. Macho Man, Randy Savage. Um, I was I was ambivalent about Hulk Hogan. I liked Hulk Hogan. I knew he was a big star, but I didn't care. Um, then, you know, in high school, I loved um, The Rock, Stone yeah. Cold. I was more of a rock guy than a Stone Cold guy, interestingly enough. Because I liked the cockiness of the rock, I always gravitated towards the heels, the bad guys. Well, like, me too. That yeah, I, I always like. I was Andre the Giant. Loved like super into Andre the Giant. A big Mr. Perfect fan. I loved Mr. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I think the heels have more fun, and yeah. it was more fun to write those promos too because you would get to be mean. You could be creative and clever with a babyface promo. It was like, I'm a good person and I work really hard and I've earned this opportunity at the championship at WrestleMania. Like those are boring to write, but when you get a heel promo, you can yeah. be insulting, you can be transgressive, you can be like all the things that make for drama. There's no drama in somebody coming out to the ring and saying, I love everyone. That <laughs> unfortunately wrestling more so than any other art form is about animosity and anger. And so yeah. you have to find ways to get people mad in the storyline and then get the audience to um, associate with or, or live vicariously through that anger. 
And, you know, now, considering the real world is so angry all the time and everybody's so um, yeah. on edge and, and cruel to each other a lot, wrestling feels not cathartic. It feels like kind of gross. Like, it yeah. feels like, why are we adding all of this this negativity into the world? Because wrestling is about negative emotions. It's about revenge. It's about spite and anger and and lust and and coveting and just all the stuff that just is gross about the world and the only way to solve a problem in wrestling is for people to fight yeah and so that just is a turnoff to me right now so i'm not really watching anymore i'm also just kind of i think um it's hard to know how the sausage is made and then you know yeah should it be made um which is why i don't watch pornography anymore (laughs) Um, I I'm always, joking. I definitely, I'm joking about that part, of course. Anyway, I've ahead. never seen a porn in my life. I don't know. All about. right. In my life. Okay. Um, I I always gravitated towards the commentators. Mm-hmm. Like I was, yeah. I'm, I'm, I was a big fan. I mean, I love Gorilla Monsoon. I was like, I worshipped Bobby Heenan. Yep. I he's, he was, he's the greatest. He, he maybe really one of the was. funniest men to ever live. Yeah, he, Somehow, he was so he great. I actually feel like he influenced a lot of my humor even today. Is just listening to him banter with like Gene Okerlund or other people. Um, they and, were they were the storytellers. They were the yeah. ones that communicated what was going on to the audience, and that's still the job is just to take the physicality, which is what you, you don't call it violence in WWE. It's called physicality. Take the physicality and you um, translate that into English. What does this mean? You know, it's like watching performance art and then explaining it to the audience. Like, well, that's yeah. this person is playing a swan and the swan is very sad. Like, that's essentially what a commentator does in wrestling. It's a hard job. It's a job that's, I think, harder than writing wrestling is doing that on the fly while someone's talking in your ear. You know, it'd be like if you were talking to me and telling me what to do while we're doing a script's gone wild. I'm like, I just need to act. Stop. I need to read the yeah. script. Stop telling me how to read it. But that's what they do. You know, Vince McMahon is telling the announcers, like, okay, you need to say that uh, uh, Dean Ambrose is uh, very upset right now. <laughs> um, so we have a reading coming up of Planet of the Apes, which you are I know. part of. I don't know who I'm playing. Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't I know hope either. An, I hope an ape. I, I, isn't that what to hope for? That's what to <laughs> read for. an ape. I mean, it's, 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 it's highly likely that I'm playing an ape since there's not many humans in the I didn't even know, like, Clay, don't just, speak. Clay messaged me out of the blue, and he was like, hey, you know Dave Schilling's a big Planet of the Apes fan? And I was like, nope, sure didn't. <laughs> oh, God, I love the Apes movies. I don't know how I, I oh, I, you know why he knows that? It's I have also been pestering him to do an Apes draft, because I love how, like, when a series like that is compact, mm-hmm. it's kind of easier to, obviously, to slot them and stuff. And there's more, there's more, um, opportunity for controversy when you have to you know figure out where they sit in the canon yeah. um so there's what seven eight eight nine apes movies well, let's so see. how many how many original ones are there there's beneath the original conquest, beneath right? escape conquest battle so five originals plus you have the, the trilogy. trilogy remake and then, no, and then so nine the total yeah nine. nine total so two movies are going to get left out and i already know which ones i would leave out I mean, it's no spoiler to say that Battle for the Planet of the Apes is a piece of shit. Uh-huh. And that I would even... It, yeah, I, the Tim Burton one is obviously the other one that has to be left out. But then yeah, you I, order them, that's fine. I would agree. I would agree with both of those omissions as well. It, easy. Those are, that's yeah. easy. The I was never, part is where do, they, where do they fit? Yeah, I was never a huge... I, I was never a huge fan of the original films. I liked the first one a lot. I just... I, I probably saw the sequels you know, a dozen times as a kid and just never, it, they were always on and I never loved them. I love the new trilogy. I'm a big fan of the new trilogy. Me too. Um, I, so it would be hard for me not to have those, you know, have that top four be the original in those three films. Um, I just love them so much and think they're so just different than what I was expecting at the time when they came out. Yeah, and they, it's a trilogy that stuck the landing. Yeah. Um, it would have been really easy to blow that but they made a very affecting movie and each one of them it feels like a a natural progression and i love that there are different characters in it that it it has this there's almost an anthology quality to those movies uh that i really think is cool because they're all three stylistically very different and they're all about different things and they're all you know 
the one is kind of like a disaster movie, like a 70s disaster movie, the first one. Yeah. And then the second one is kind of a classic like survival horror movie in a way. And then the third one is like a war movie. Yeah. Um, I, and yeah, I just, I think they're fantastic. I don't know besides the first one, if there is an, an original um, apes movie that's better than any of them. Yeah. Maybe Escape from the Planet of the Apes because it's just a pure comedy, which is hilarious yes. to me because, <laughs> so as you know, the first Planet of the Apes movie is built around the twist at the end. Yeah. Oh God, it's Earth. And then the second one, it just goes completely off the rails. And then by the end of it, they've blown up the entire planet with a nuclear <laughs> nuclear bomb. And it's like, okay, this is maybe the ble bleaker than the first ending. It's now there is no, like, everyone's dead. The planet is still there, but it's yeah. irradiated and, and uh, you know, everyone's going to be a mutant. But all the people underground are already mutants, but now everyone's going to be a mutant. So then they follow that up with a fish-out-of-water comedy <laughs> where these two apes go back in time to the 70s. And it's just like, this is, that's what I love about the series is, is the camp quality of it. Um, the the differences in tone and theme uh, of every movie, they're all, like I said, e even the first five, they all feel different. Uh, and then Conquest, you know, is is a real kind of like classic 70s dystopia that they filmed in a mall. <laughs> like, well, let's go to a, the mall in Century City and we'll pretend like that's the future. Um, just a great, great franchise. Um, I'm excited to do this. There's a lot of really, really good talented people on this one yeah. I, I feel like a schmuck being on this list yeah it, it it kind of just all came together in a really good way i mean i was i was ecstatic when lorraine newman said yes oh yeah as an snl nerd that's very very cool yeah like that was and i have no idea who's re who's reading either uh, that you know frank i assume is still devising all that i'm excited to see what dana comes up with for the script too Oh, is he um, making changes to it? Yeah, yeah, Dana is doing, you know, Dana Gould did this thing with Plan 9 from Outer Space where he basically took the script and kind of rewrote the script. It's all the dialogue, but he sort of wrote it in a sort of like a Mystery Science Theater 3000 kind of way. Oh, great. And so he's doing the same thing with the Planet of the Apes script. Well, he is the foremost apes expert, and uh, I have some friends um, who still write for The Simpsons, and they, they tell many great stories about how, his love of Planet of the Apes and uh, and uh, his affection for it and all that stuff. So I'm very excited about that. That sounds awesome that he's going to be you know changing it and doing fun things to it. So that makes it doubly cool that I get to be able to it. Yeah. And then uh, you get to do some Shining as well. I'm doing the Shining too. Yeah, God, you have really just like take, taken up my whole life now. It's, it's I, me, me hanging out with my son. Yep. And then it's doing scripts gone wild. And then it's screen, a screen draft here and there. So that's my life now. That's what we do. We like to just completely <laughs> invade people's lives and make us their priority. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so uh, welcome to the end of your life. <laughs> oh, I also have to, to, you know, shout out Jonah Ray is in this one, in the Planet of the Apes one. Yeah. And Jonah and I are good, good buddies. And uh, we're actually going to be doing a Zoom drinks call tonight. So Oh, that's awesome. I'll have to, I'll have to let him know because he's not on Twitter anymore. So he probably doesn't know that I am going to be in. He probably does it. And and yeah, Jonah did. Jonah just did our Fright Night read. And that's then, right. And then found out afterwards or during that read that we were doing The Burbs and Planet of the Apes and then messaged just right after was like, I need to do both of these reads. <laughs> he's also a bored person. He doesn't have <laughs> anything to do. He's an actor, so he's just waiting for a camera to turn on all the well, time. That's what we're here for, bored actors. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> well, Dave, thanks for sitting down and chatting with us for a little of while. Of course. You uh, know what I love to do? I love to talk, so this is a pleasure for me. I'm just um, waiting to talk. I'm going to give a couple of plugs for some upcoming things. So as I mentioned earlier, we have the Burbs coming up on September 9th that Jonah is in, along with Clark Wolf and Quentin Flynn and a bunch of other fun folks. Then we've got The Shining on the 16th, Planet of Apes on the 23rd. And uh, we've got some fun happy hour chats. We've got Mr. Dave Schillings, which will be dropping to our Patreon subscribers uh, tomorrow, which is Friday. Uh, so actually, when you're hearing this, it'll be right now. And yeah, you're uh, literally listening yeah. to it right now. Right, this second. And wow. then it'll, it'll drop to the rest of YouTube on Monday. And for them, they'll also be hearing it right now. Right now. It's all happening now. And then we're going to sit down with uh, Miss Tiffany Sheffis next week and chat with her about uh, all things horror. 
Uh, so once again, thank you, sir, for joining us. And you can find us at scriptsgonewild.com, Scripts Gone Wild across all social media. And uh, we're running a 501c3 fund campaign right now, which you can donate to at gofundme.com slash Scripts Gone Wild Fund. Dave, where can people find you? I am on Twitter at Dave underscore Schilling, and you can find Full Court Chat on literally every pod cl- podcast platform. I can't say that. <laughs> um, so please subscribe, leave a review, binge it this weekend. You've got three days. Whenever you're listening to this, turn this off, go binge it right now, and tell literally everyone you know. I like the sound of that. <laughs> and, uh, and if you don't like it, feel free to leave nothing but nasty reviews. Please. No, don't. that was a joke. That was a joke. Please don't do that. Don't. Please. I hate people who do that. I hate people. So just don't s- leave a review. I'm so sad. Yeah, yeah don't leave a review. Be, be, just don't leave a review. Don't. Um, okay. Thank you, sir. Goodbye.